Welcome to Long Live Bat Art, the podcast for art lovers who don't see art as much as they want to. My name is Sydney, and thank you for taking this slow tour through an art gallery with a casual art lover. Today, I'll be talking about The Milkmaid, painted by Johannes Vermeer. I hope you enjoy. So Vermeer has been one of my favorite artists since I was a little kid when my aunt first exposed me to him. She actually has a drawing I did when I was probably under 10 of Girl with a Pearl Earring. Yes, I was a bit pretentious as a kid with few friends. As you might expect from an artist in the season about Dutch masters, Vermeer was born in the Netherlands, Delft to be more specific. He was born Protestant but converted to Catholicism when he married his wife Katerina Bolnez. His first paintings were biblical scenes, but most of his surviving paintings, of which sadly there are less than 40, are of scenes with ordinary people. Very little is known about Vermeer's artistic training and even the man himself. The mystery surrounding the man because he left little trace made Theophile Thoroughberger, an art critic that rediscovered Vermeer in the 1800s, call him the Sphinx of Delft, which is a baller nickname. And Vermeer didn't think of it himself which is a huge no-no in my eyes of having an awesome nickname. It doesn't count if you call yourself that. The sweet nickname must be bestowed upon you. When I was researching, I was surprised and delighted to learn that he actually registered as a master painter on my birthday, December 29th in 1653, just a few years before I was born. But there are some fellow painters that art historians think he knew, either through historical documentation or taking inspiration. Leonard Brommer, whose documents show was a witness of Vermeer's wedding, was a multifaceted painter who did both biblical and mythological-based paintings and large murals for the Prince of Orange. But it doesn't seem as though Brommer was Vermeer's master he studied under. Maybe he was just an advocate and friend. Carol Fabricius was a former Rembrandt student that Vermeer knew. Modern art historians and a contemporary poet of both men, Arnold Bonn, compares Vermeer favorably to Fabricius. But again, there's no evidence that Vermeer ever studied with Fabricius. Some scholars think he may have been an apprentice under Abraham Blomart, who we will cover later this season. Two other painters that Vermeer might have known or just been aware of their works were Gerard Turboke and Peter de Hooch. Turboke also depicted ordinary people doing ordinary things, but in dark settings. Vermeer's paintings are often filled with light, which you'll hear when I describe the painting and then tell you my thoughts. Hooch and Vermeer shared subjects and styles, so that's why art historians believe they might have known each other. The way Vermeer worked is also unclear. No drawings made by him in preparation for his paintings have survived. Because of this, there are some critics who claim that he used a camera to capture his subjects and help him with his work. This is a hotly debated topic, but I will throw my admittedly inexperienced hat in the ring. Even if Vermeer did use a camera to aid him, that was only one part of his process. The simple fact is that you can't discount the man's talent in producing gorgeous works. Those who say that using a camera is, quote, cheating, unquote, aren't taking into account that a camera is just a tool, just like a paintbrush or pencil. If the artist can't use it properly, it's no use to them. I was astounded to learn that only about 20 colors were used by Vermeer in all of his works. He had such an eye for detail and color that to use such a limited palette is extraordinary. I dabble in art myself, and finding any kind of limited palette is generally what artists do to challenge themselves. Granted, Vermeer probably had fewer options of color to begin with, but the fact that he was able to produce such gorgeous and lifelike colors with only 20 as a base is incredible. Unfortunately, the peak of Vermeer's career was only about 10 years from the late 1650s to the late 1660s. He was named the head of the Painters Guild in 1662. There is no surviving evidence that Vermeer did any work under commission during his lifetime, but he did seem to have a small number of loyal fans. He died in 1675. As is the sad case with most artists, he wasn't appreciated during his life, but soared in popularity centuries after his death because of collections of his works being in prestigious museums. 
I was surprised to learn that Salvador Dali was a fan of his and redid one of Vermeer's paintings, The Lace Maker, in his own style. There's also a painting that Dali did that calls the master by name, The Ghost of Vermeer of Delft, which can be used as a table. Now that you have a bit of background knowing a little about the artist, let's move on to the painting. The woman looks wistful as she pours the milk, like she's thinking of a lover or maybe a better life. Or maybe she's just daydreaming. Who knows? She's wearing a yellow shirt and a blue apron over a red skirt with a white bonnet on her head and a white undershirt that shows near her throat. You can't see her hair. The colors are vibrant but soft. Even the shadows are soft. The light is coming from a tall grated window on the left. The sunlight comes in without casting any shadows on the woman's face. The food on the table below the window is bread and what looks like croissants or another breakfast pastry. They're rendered lovingly. You can see where the bread would crackle if you touched it. There's something else on the table, something silver, a jug maybe or another receptacle for liquid. The blue-green tablecloth, a touch more green than blue, is draped over the table so you can see it's smooth and the corners are straight. There's another blue cloth on top of the tablecloth, this one a napkin draping down. It was carelessly dropped on the table. The folds are highlighted. The light hits the top and the bottom is shadowed so it's hard to see where it ends because it blends into the tablecloth and drapes out of sight. On the far side of the window, there's a basket hanging on the wall above a brass oil lamp. You can see the shine of the sunlight on the hammered metal. Above that is some cloth hanging on the peg. Maybe a dishcloth, I'm not sure. The basket and oil lamp are casting gentle shadows on the wall. Going back to the milkmaid and her clothes. The yellow shirt is rolled above her elbows. You can see the underfabric is dark blue and the folds are slightly more green than yellow. The folds are wide and again, soft. The bodice is pulled tightly across her chest. There aren't any folds. The fasteners down the center are darker, merely suggested by a line but you can see the seam on the side closer to the viewer of the painting. Her blue apron is gathered around her waist. You can see each pleat. The apron is folded into a triangle with its point towards the ground. It's like the other half of the apron got caught on the edge of the table and is being held on top of it. Under it, you can see her red skirt, which is pleated gently. The folds are darker red. She's pouring milk from a jug into a handled bowl. They're both made of fired brown clay. The bowl has ridges on it. The shadows from them are thrown onto the ones below it. The milk itself is slightly darker than white and cascading down from the jug. The inside of the jug is dark, but you can still see where the mouth ends and the rest of the jug begins. Her skin has been lovingly depicted. She's pale, the bottoms of her arms in shadow from the rest of her body blocking the light. You can see the dimpling of her left elbow as her hand steadies the jug. Her right hand is holding the handle of the jug she's pouring out of. Her touch is light. Her face, like I said before, is wistful. She's looking down at her task and her face is soft. She has a very high forehead and even this quote undesirable unquote characteristic is rendered with just as much love as the rest of the piece. Going away from the figure, there's some kind of wooden box on the floor behind her. It's like a tiny stool. The top has rows of holes as if for ventilation and the front has a small red door. It might be for coal to keep the food or room warm. The box has a lip on the top and the bottom. Vermeer rendered even those small details in a box which is just as much care as the rest of the piece. The wall behind the box has four square gray tiles with darker gray details at its base. They could be figures but it's unclear. The walls are discolored and uneven, but even those are detailed. Now for my thoughts. As I said before, Vermeer has always been one of my favorites. The way he's able to capture color and light is incredible. The details in his paintings. One can spend hours looking at it and still see new things. I'm sure I'll describe more of his work in future seasons. You can see the shadow of the dimpling in her elbow and the crust crackles of the bread. His work is painstaking and beautiful. But I love him not only for his technical ability, but because of the subject matter he's known for. 
he depicted even the most basic and quote boring or pedestrian unquote of tasks in loving detail. He showed everyday life and the people and things that made up it in a light that makes people stop and examine every detail. He depicted life with such softness. I like that he depicted everyday people instead of just kings, mythical figures, or other such prestigious and memorable people that the majority of depictions of them in art. Drawing inspiration from and memorializing everyday life is a noble pursuit. These are people that walked the streets with Vermeer, who ate and drank and laughed and loved and made mistakes right along with him. They were human. And it's that common humanity that makes it so much more interesting that he chose them as subjects. Maybe we may never know their names. Maybe they didn't even really look like that and were instead idealized by Vermeer. But their existence is preserved. Vermeer captured such beauty in everyday life. And to be reminded that beauty and new experiences are really all around us is a lovely thing. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're pouring milk as this subject is, or grocery shopping, or running other errands, there is a magical quality to life that if you can just open your eyes, you can see. Here's a challenge for you. Find something few people like, or even something you yourself don't like, and find something beautiful in it. You can pick dandelions, animals most people think are gross, or, if you're feeling ambitious, the one person that you dislike the most. Find something beautiful or interesting about it. And if you can manage to do that, life gets a lot more beautiful. If you liked this episode of Long Live Bad Art, please consider telling a friend and reviewing to help the podcast grow. A link to the transcript of this episode is available in the show notes below. Thank you for listening to this episode, and I'll see you in two weeks.